So uh, welcome back, everyone. Uh, we are here with uh, Dave Kester. And who do you got with you there today, Dave? This is my new new hunting hawk, passage red tail hawk. Her name is Pearl, named by my oldest son, who for some reason gets to name all my hawks. Okay. Well, <laughs> I don't get to name them anymore. Thanks for stopping by today. I think we told uh, people a little bit that we were going to have you talk about, uh, since you are a falconer, mm -hmm. uh, you can talk a little bit about uh, uh, how you got Pearl, you know, what we do with uh, trapping and what the reasons we trap birds are for and uh, a little bit about that. And then, you know, maybe I'll key in later and, and uh, we can talk a little bit about a possible collaborative project here that we might have coming up with doing some trapping and monitoring with Luther College. Right. Okay. Good. Well, thanks for coming in, Dave. Dave Kester is one of our board members. Uh, well, uh, for me, uh, this all started with my association with, with Bob Anderson, and uh, uh, whose who's passion for raptors, and then the sport of falconry uh, started when, way when, back when he was a boy. And he uh, worked with many of the, the luminaries uh, in the art of falconry over the years and connected to royalty as, as we, some of us think of them and I met Bob in 1997 and fell in love with the Paradigm Project and started assisting with him and learned about the sport of falconry and knew I wanted to do that. Uh, the hunting of prey with a, in this case a wild trap talk but nowadays there's also a uh, uh, a commercial process where hawks can be um, um, acquired through breeders, which came out of the uh, breeding project of trying to reintroduce peregrines back into the wild. That's an extension of, of that process. So where did Pearl come from? Pearl How, came from uh, just over by the Mississippi River. Uh, I was trapping with, with Neil and Laura, who you saw earlier today, and um, we were trying on a, on a windy day, we thought there might be a big movement. There was a big flight and we were seeing lots of red tails, but they were all high and they were all moving. So we finally gave up on ground trapping and did went out and started doing a little road trapping. And we, we found a lot of hawks that were way down low in the valleys, out of the wind and hunting and not doing too much movement that day. And we used techniques that have been used for centuries. We use it's called a BC trap or a ball chitri trap, which is a little hardware cloth dome cage with uh, mice in it. And when you see a hawk, you'll throw that out of the vehicle and get out of there and let them see the mice. They come in and they can get caught. Pearl got caught by one foot in in one noose, and we had her and. Um, uh, so that's where we caught her. We caught her uh, on that on that type of day. It was just uh, the hawks, the hawks that were migrating, and there was a lot. Uh, they just weren't coming down. The winds were too strong, and so we went to the low ground. So how long has it been since you you uh, uh, acquired her, and and what does what how's that basic process work? It's been about a month. She I've flown her free one time so far. Uh, going out again today, and I want to have people with me. I, sometimes you fly and free the first time because you want to keep distractions to a minimum, but it was too much for me because I, uh, red tails like to get up high in the trees. They like to sit there and watch while you do all the bushwhacking and the work, trying to get rabbits and squirrels, and so I'm in all the thick of the stuff, and um, I'm not able to keep track of her. It was her first flight, and I really wanted to, but she did great. I did get one slip for her, which is falcon return for showed her some prey because I saw her come down on a nice stoop and then chase around the fence line a little bit. So I never saw the rabbit, but she did. And so that kind of fired her up. And so she stuck around really well. And uh, after really, she got a nice perch and after really pushing hard, I didn't get anything else out. So I called her down because they say that any day that you go home with your hawk in hand is a good day of hawking. So that's what I wanted. So we had a good day, but we're going to go out again today and, and we're going to have a, going out with Neil and Laura, in fact, and they have a bird 
And so that way, I, she's able to keep an eye on her and watch her behavior more, uh, especially as a newly, newly trained hawk. That's great. That's great. So, uh, what uh, what will you do with her? You'll take her out hunting, right? Right. And rabbits and squirrels. Rabbits typically. and squirrels. You know, it's just kind of primary squirrels. Some, I think, I think particularly this hawk. When we trapped her, she had little sores and scabs and bite marks on her feet and in the woods that she was in makes us think that she was probably doing a little bit of squirreling on her own anyway so I think that comes kind of next to I don't think she's chased rabbits too much it's mostly with red tails as big as they are it's really mostly voles and mice and chipmunks and small rodents snakes when they're out things of that nature so it, it's pretty much, uh, how's that relationship between you and, and Pearl? Is that pretty intimate? Do you guys work uh, together? We, it's, yeah, we totally together. I get that question uh, a lot of times when I will do a little talk with kids because they want to know what our bond is. And it's not like uh, a dog and, and, and your bond. It's not just friendship. She is a wild animal. And she still is. And by using the manning process that has been used for centuries, falconry has been around for a long time. And we do it the same way that they did hundreds and hundreds of years ago. And what has been, happened now is she has accepted me as a food source and that um, she can trust me and that... Uh, I had another way of putting that and I kind of lost it. Um, but she is, I've conditioned her to, she, she went from being in the trap and being grabbed by me thinking I am the gigantic monster who is going to eat her to now trusting me and will follow me. I will let her loose, she'll go from top of the trees and she will bounce around from the tree to tree to branch to branch looking for the best vantage point. While I'm on the ground doing all the hard work, crawling through the multiflora rows in a honey softball, trying to get something up for her, and then she flies after it, tries to catch. And the flights are dramatic, and that's why I do it. The falconer falls much more in love with the raptor than the raptor does with the falconer. The, the, the raptor tolerates me. She's accepted me that I'm not gonna hurt her, and that I am a pretty good way of getting through the winter and, and she's going to eat well. This is, a, this is called a passage bird in falconry terms, meaning she's a first, she's a hatcher bird. She's, she just hatched this spring. She's been dispersed from her nest site. She's been just kind of moving around, maybe getting ready for the migration. And the mortality rates on raptors in general is 70 to 75 percent in the first year, meaning three out of four don't survive to the second year or to their breeding population. So by law, by regulation, we do not remove uh, a, a hawk of any sort from the breeding population for the sport. We, we will remove one uh, that's part of that first migration uh, uh, population. And in my mind, I think I'm doing her a service because this one happened to be, uh, like a friend said, loaded with parasites. She had a lot of roundworms. Um, she, had, she had a feather lice. So she had parasites that, she's, you know, that could compromise her. And I was able to treat her for that. And, and by the time we're done, she will be a stronger, fitter, better hunter bird um, than she was when I caught her. And then she, I feel she'll have a better, better shot at going out and, and being a, a, a producing red tail hawk, you know, in the population. So that's neat. I, I bet a lot of people don't know that. So you might have her for a year, two years, three years. It's then... left to the discretion of the falcon. They, I, I can have her for a day or a full season, or I can have her for the rest of her natural life. Um, Oh, it's going to go somewhere again. Bring me back. <laughs> so, uh, um, do you want to uh, show her, uh, take her hood off? I can, or? yeah. And, then, and, then, and I'll describe it. The, the, again, this hood, and this is, this is a Dutch hood. It is Anglo-Indo. 
in the in those uh, style hoods that are there's different style hoods these are still the same styles that have been made again for centuries and it, what it is is you'll see me remove it from the back the braces back here and it'll slide off here and you can see the rounded parts that protects their eyes but it darkens it so while they're such a visual animal that by sitting in the dark it keeps them calm now when I take the hood off she's going to start looking at you and anything else or anybody else in the room and she's going to look down here for something to eat um, and then when there isn't she's going to look at me and say like what's up and maybe <laughs> we should probably go do some hawking okay uh, but you're going to be struck by uh, the intensity and the naturalness of her eyes I think So this is Pearl. So currently right now she is looking for something to eat. Yeah, it looks like she's looking down at the glove. She's done she's done all her eating off the glove so far. See, now she's wondering why I don't have something there. And now she'll start exploring her surroundings. And this is what I do a lot of this as part of the manning process. I will take her Oh, we'll sit in front of the TV, and I'll give her what's called a tire ring in falconry terms. It'll, it's a, a, a pigeon wing or something for her to pull on, not get a lot of nutrition, um, but something for her just to work on. Uh, and she can hear the noise of the TV. She can see my kids running around in the room. She can see the dog running around in the room. Um, she can see other people come through, we'll put her on a perch in that room and she'll just sit there in that perch while other people walk around, just get her used to be, because ordinarily as soon, if they see man-made object, they see it all the time, it doesn't bother them. But the second they see human movement, they've been persecuted by humans for so long, they're out of there. So to take her from that mindset to being perfectly comfortable in a human setting, is what the manning process is all about. And the more you can do that in training, the less adventures you have out in the field. That's great. Well, uh, Neil and Laura are here too. Uh, any questions that you guys... Uh, or anything you might want to help me yeah, bring Dave, up? I think the, you know, the listeners and uh, people watching will be interested to know again if you... You know, it's amazing to me that you can take a wild bird and in four or five weeks, fly it free and have it come back to you. And the bird is working with you as a team. You're as a, team. a team. You're you're the dog that's kicking up the rabbits, and right. the hawk follows you. Right. A and little it, bit more elaborate. And it is completely the bird's choice at any moment whether to continue to work with you or to take off. And do well, that we we do form a team, a, a team or a partnership. That's Neil's exactly right. That the bird and, and they learn quickly that. Um, she, she's looking, she's, she is looking for food because I am going to go hawk her today. So she is, she's what's in falconry terms being keen or sharp. She's, she hasn't eaten yet today. She's that, she's that flying weight, which is the weight you want to have them, um, uh, to be hungry and focused in the field and will come back when called. But by no means, they're not being starved down. They, they're monitored very closely by the falconer uh, to be fit you see when I move she's grabbing them so she's you know but fit you know athletes is what they are so it, it, that's the kind of condition we're trying to put them in but yeah the hawk figures it out very quickly that just by moving up into the tree and they can see the falconer working underneath and pushing game in front of them you know in this case in, in where, the area where I live it's rabbits and squirrels and um, uh, they, they, they learn it very quickly. She did that. I've only had her flying free one time. And, and she did get up in the trees and she did move and they almost follow. We say follow like a dog, you know. But, you know, once you have bushwhacked so much farther ahead of them, they will, f you know, if they haven't, which a lot of times they do, you just use the whistle or a call and they will bounce up and find a new perch right up in front of you. And sometimes they'll take a perch that you don't understand while they're there, but that's because they see something creeping, you know, that you have no idea that is there. But the bond is strong. It's just that 
they don't have feelings for us that we have for them, like a dog, that, that type of bond. She's a wild animal that has accepted the position she's in, and she's figured it out that, you know, I'm going to profit pretty well if I stay in this. But Laura's right. It is completely the bird's decision. If she catches a thermal or just the spirit moves her and she's up there, she can just get up and fly away. And, and that is her choice. That's part of the excitement. That's part of the stress of being a falconer. But uh, it is an incredible responsibility and it's an incredible honor to be able to work with an animal and, like this. And Bob Anderson was an uh, avid falconer. I mean, that's, Bob Anderson that was, was an avid falconer. Bob was my sponsor. That's, that's, yeah. who, that's who, which, like I think, I, I forget who I was interviewed by. Um, but I'll eternally be grateful for Bob because of uh, the expertise he brought to it. And, his, and I'm not his only apprentice. He had, he had he had a multitude of them. And uh, he had a unique way of, he didn't say, you have to go do this. He would kind of just flow the suggestion out, you know, and let you process it because the learning curve is steeper that way. Um, but Bob was my sponsor for learning how to that. And some people do, we're allowed to, under our permits to uh, expand into different birds, you know, and, and for different quarry and different type of flying. Where I live here, the red tail works really well, uh, but I love the red tail hawk. They are, they have a a demeanor about them that is, it, it is they're a calm bird. They're very forgiving for falconers' mistakes, uh, and. Um, they're 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 a dynamic. They're they're varied in their flights. Uh, they can they can fly in a stoop really fast. They can do really quick accipiter like flights through the woods. Yeah. Uh, um, when we are doing fall migration banding work, and you can see a red-tailed hawk in the glasses and binoculars and watch them coming to the lure miles away. And they're in this diamond stoop, and they're hammering towards the lure, and then you can just see them come racing in, and then the feet drop, and the wings come out, and they start dumping air, air brakes kind of stuff. It is just one of the most spectacular, exciting, blood curdling experiences you'll ever have. It's hard to describe, but it is. It's hard not to go. Whoa! Look at that. You know, because you're supposed to be quiet because you're in the blind because you're trying to catch this hawk. And they have this window uh, into the natural world that the hawk opens for you. Uh, you learn. You learn about the prey. You learn about the the, the, the whole network of a habitat. You know, I've learned a lot about the natural history of of the reptile of her hawk and other and other raptors. But but Neil's exactly right. Now I have to learn about its prey base. And then I have to learn what sustains its prey base. And then of course it all networks out, you know. And so the learning curve is huge in how connected everything is. And you usually learn that this is the you know top line predator, you know, and that's that was part of what we learned with the peregrine falcon when the peregrine became in, in such trouble and we learned because it was a top line predator and, and, and DDT was moving up through the, the, the habitat and the food system and that's how we discovered that that was an issue that needed to be fixed and fixed quickly or we were going to lose them and that's part of part of what you can learn through working with the top line and, and being a top line predator, the, the, the main creature that these birds hunt are meadow mice, or voles. Voles, right? yeah. yeah. Like Bob used to call Bob them. I love that. Yeah, yeah, the, the, the vole highway, you know, because that's the habitat that's left now. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, it's just the ditches. A lot of hawks along the highways. You, yeah. you know, they're, they're not there chasing, they're there because that's where the voles and the mice are. Yeah. And the grasslands are gone. well, right, so they can see close to the ground and see yep, that yeah, there's more that's going on. It'd be nice if they'd mow a little later on, and, you know, at least let them, one, <laughs> one uh, of the, for the grass nesters to at least put out one clutch, you know, but uh, after that, that's a whole other subject. 
So, so Dave, can you turn her around just a minute so we can see her tail? You say she's oh, sure. a red tail hawk. This a is dog. a red tail hawk. How come she she's doesn't so have brown. a red tail? And we would call her the brown bird. She's in her juvenile plumage. You can see, and it's yeah. and it's when's, banded when's, and it's dark brown. And it, 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 you know, it's like a red tail. Yep, she's it's camouflage because she's learning how to survive her first year. Um, they do this thing when they're on the ground and they're eating. It's called mantling, where and I've seen them where where an eagle. You know, I see her. Other hawks have mantled. You know, we've caught something and we're in the bushes, and an, an eagle. And I, I didn't see it, but she gets way down flat as she can over the prey. The wings go out, the head goes down. She's very still. She's mantling over her prey, and you look up and there goes this eagle flying over. So. Um, this is all disguise. Then she will, she will molt in. It's called the molt. And in her second summer, she will molt into her adult plumage or the breeding plumage. And that's when she will lose some of this belly band look. This brown will change color, and her eyes will darken. If, I don't know how well you can see her eyes. Uh, they're very light. They're olive colored. And as she ages, they will get dark, dark, dark brown. And then, of course, she'll have the classic cinnamon brick colored uh, red tail. So uh, that's awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that information. Uh, so with the trapping station, we talked a little bit about a possible collaborative project about doing some uh, trapping, raptor resource project yeah. uh, locally here. Um, just, uh, it's not a done deal yet, but we're talking to Luther College, right? To do a collaborative project with some of their students and some of their teachers. That's exactly right. And that leads into, you know, now that we, what, what Raptor Resource Project is, is trying to, you know, when we first lost Bob, we were all, what now? You know, what are we going to, are we going to exist? Are we going to move forward? And, and when we decided that, yep, we'll come together as a board and we'll move forward, uh, education was one of uh, the foremost uh, aspects of, of, of what Bob wanted to provide through the Raptor Resource Project. And, and I have worked for years with, with John Strawbers to, because he taught me a lot about hot trapping over along the Mississippi River uh, through the 90s and the 2000s. Uh, during the fall, the hawks might migrate, and and through the, the USGS birding land, they, uh, the the federal uh, program, they issue bands, numerical bands, that we as hawks that we trap, we put these bands on release, and they try to monitor populations, movements, and things like that. And I, I did that for years with John and was talking with Bob. And then I moved from the Mississippi River area over to Decorah. Um, and there was another uh, bander here years ago who banded for a couple of years. Um, you know, he's moved, to, he's moved on. And we presented to Luther the idea about a, co a collaborative effort on some of their property uh, with some of their biology and other science departments, uh, a new fall migration banding station um, with them. And they seemed very, very excited about it. It would be on Luther land. Um, we would be able to do the, the trapping that we've historically done over along the Mississippi River. This is not one of the stronger flyways, but hawks do migrate through here. Um, but they would have so they would they it's a way for Luther to to get their students out into the field, learn the rudiments of of field research. They could bring in, um, and these are just a lot of thoughts that I'm trying to that we're talking back and forth. But they could there's there's what I want to do is I want to start chronicling not only just how many hawks you catch a day and which ones they were and turning that invasion in, but I want to watch the weather patterns. I want to know what the barometer was saying that day. I want to know what the wind was that day. I want to know what the temperatures were. And then also doing counts and seeing, you know, a correlation between wind direction, barometer, air pressure, 
you know, which would be a great project for uh, a Luther student working, you know, uh, learning how to do field work as they move into the real world into their own biological studies. Uh, it, it, it seems just like a win-win for us as a, as a project and, and being locally here uh, so we can, we can man our it quite a bit. And then what they could bring in for their students to learn what it's like to be out in the field. So that really touches on two things RRP has been doing, both education and education outreach, and then also monitoring, just like we do up along the Mississippi River flyway area uh, from Iowa all the way up into northern Minnesota, right? Uh, banding and monitoring uh, the, the young each year, and then there's some trapping and monitoring that's done seasonally by, by folks, and uh, there's an opportunity there, right? Uh, right. Um, and that uh, is it one, another skill of Dave. He's one of our premier climbers. He and Amy Reese uh, really are the, the climbers that we've got here uh, um, on, the, on the monitoring program. When does that start up? Uh, it, you know, in February, in February, they're already starting to see, uh, they're already starting to see um, uh, uh, birds come back, in particular the power plant birds. You know, some of them, and right. if they even leave at all, they don't leave for long. And, and it takes a lot of time which Bob, Bob was the main driving time up and down the river. Right. Where the hope is is to not only get up and down the river and check the sites, but spend more time at the sites uh, with the landowners too, right? With and with the landowners too, and with that type of outreach and and I relocation and become more efficient. But definitely, there was so much work and effort put into that process of the project. Uh, in the early days of like reestablishing peregrines, you know, out on the on the cliffs, that um, that I'm sorry, that made me lose my train of thought. Yeah. Uh, um, that to just to maintain, you know, we got we got them on. They're on the rocks again. Now we need to maintain uh, our eye on them and the nest sites and the nest site population right. and continuing with the banding project that goes along with that uh, because it's right. it's just too important to let slip away. So that annual monitoring of all the different nest sites that we're in control of and that we know of, uh, which is quite a few, uh, uh, falcon banding typically in June? It, yeah, yeah we, we start monitoring the river sites in, in late February, the birds are already returning. And so that means March and April in particular, a lot of time out on the river, monitoring the cliff sites, seeing if there's any activity. Uh, uh, cer certain birds are birds that are going to nest here, some kind of just around or tundra birds that are just moving through. Uh, so monitoring numbers that you're seeing throughout the whole spring, northern migration. And then uh, in late May, uh, the banding of the ISs start, and that can go in uh, deep into June. It's very, very busy time because it's, uh, there's so many now, because it's, we're not doing just the cliffs. As you know, we, you know we're, we're still with the, with the power plants and the nest box right. program. And, and nest boxes that have been installed on other buildings or in, buildings, the, in yeah. the urban environment, we're handling that as well. Uh, so it, it, it's gotten, it has become real big. And it does work in tandem with the spring migration banding and then pick it back up in the fall uh, with, with the fall movement. Well, that's great. Um, we, uh, we thank you for coming in, bringing Pearl here we're, today. We were happy to be here. As you can tell, she's, She's looking pretty happy. She's, she's ready. She, she's ready. She, <laughs> she's ready to go hopping. That sounds great. Thanks again, Dave Pester. And uh, uh, again, Dave's one of our board members. And uh, we appreciate all that you do for RRP. Thank, Thank you. you very much, John.